Thank you very much for that introduction. I'll have to update my website because I have rolled off the PAA board, but a big supporter of, of the PAA as an organization. So thanks for having me. Um, it's really great to be back at OPR, even though I get the rush of feeling like a student up here. So um, hopefully I can pull it together. Um, so today, like many of you who study population health, the last two and a half years, um, you know, I've been knee deep in a lot of COVID research, as well as some science communication and public outreach, um, which came about very unexpectedly. And so from the beginning of the pandemic, I started um, giving talks about the ways in which I thought demography was really contributing in an ongoing way to understanding key features of the pandemic, um, such as mortality. And you know, as the months went by, there's you know lots of things have transpired. Many more COVID waves, um, you know, the vaccine rollout, all, a lot of different dynamics. So, so that kind of talk, you know, walking through the various waves of the pandemic has gotten quite long. And now I'm I'm going to focus a bit more on the mortality experiences of um, a, a broad array of countries, but especially the U.S. and the U.K., which um, are two countries both dear to my heart now and have had some interesting similarities and differences in their COVID mortality um, experiences. And I think, you know, understanding the, the causal um, explanations for why different countries had different experiences is going to be a really um, important challenge going forward. But I think at this point, we can look at the data and some different hypotheses and um, at least see kind of things that fit or might not fit is, is by way of explanation. And hopefully throughout, I'll try to point out ways in which I think demography and a population perspective has been um, really important for, for understanding the pandemic. Um, so if you'll indulge some, some demography memes, this was really back in the beginning of March, 2020. Um, if you guys can put yourself back in that headspace, um, you know, we were getting just a lot of raw data um, for the first time, I, we had colleagues from our center um, who were in Italy and had gone back to their families kind of as things got um, started to, to get bad there and were getting daily reports. Um, and this really was the first um, place, you know, outside of Wuhan where we saw very high mortality um, in Italy. And I know it's hard to remember, but we really didn't even have basic facts about this virus yet, <coughs> thinking about how lethal um, is you know, SARS-CoV-2 was actually a really important question. Um, so there were a lot of people at that time saying, is this as lethal as the flu? Um, you know, that now has become kind of a contrarian talking point, but at the time it was a really important question to try to nail down um, the, you know, what we call the infection fatality rate, your chances of dying um, conditional on infection. And fortunately, the Italian um, public health agency was, was quite good at releasing um, their data in a timely fashion, their daily mortality data. Um, so this last column here is um, what we would call the case fatality rate um, of the percent of people dying um, you know, per infection. And of course, one thing we all knew at this time was that our denominators were not accurate um, as far as how many people were infected you almost um, always had to be admitted to the hospital to count in this denominator. So we knew that um, we were underestimating um, infections and thus overestimating um, the CFRs. But for demographers, what became you know, very clear looking at this um, data was the, the strong age pattern in mortality um, of how steep that gradient was. And again, as demographers, you know, mortality always goes up with age. So, so maybe this doesn't seem that surprising, but for novel pathogens, um, that's a pattern we really don't know what's gonna happen. Obviously flu can hit um, kids um, as well as older people quite um, severely and the 1918 flu pandemic hit young adults particularly hard. So seeing this age pattern was really important um, bit of information. And so even if we don't kind of take these numbers at face value, you can see the huge concentration of deaths um, above, above age um, 60 in Italy. And um, so in thinking about why mortality was so high in Italy, um, the thing that came to mind um, for demographers was that Italy is also one of the oldest um, countries in the world with 23% of the population above age 65. 
And, you know, this was March, literally the weekend of March um, 15th, 2020. And we put out a preprint um, just kind of talking about this basic point, but I was kind of comforted to know that demographers all around the world were, were thinking about this um, at exactly the same time and trying to make sense of this um, COVID mortality data. So um, it seemed appropriate that this was the most demography thing ever to, to think about population age structure. And our center um, so put out a paper at the time um, again, so the, the you know, pandemic had not yet spread across most of the world. So we were kind of speculating um, with some stylized examples of how um, for a uniform level of infection, the mortality rates, or, you know, absolute mortality would be much higher in countries with older age structures. And so this was comparing Italy um, and Korea, for example. And obviously in reality, there were lots of of different factors that played out that were important besides age structure, but the pattern of who was getting infected, um, the age pattern of who was getting infected and the age you know, structure of those populations remain a really important factor for understanding um, how fatal COVID-19 actually was. Um, and so eventually we did get some good numbers of trying to uh, pinpoint that denominator, you know, how many people are getting infected. Uh, and this came about from some different seroprevalence studies where um, we were able to sample representative um, samples of a population and see who had been exposed in that, um, especially the first wave, to get some handle on the actual infection fatality rate um, ratio. And you can see here again that this, um, as we kind of saw in the raw data, really, really varied by age. So, you know, to say is this, um, you know, as lethal as the flu is kind of um, not very helpful to try to come up with one summary number of the infection fatality rate. We can see it ranges from, you know, 1.4% at age 65, um, going up to 4.6% at age 75. Um, so this, um, this study was just really nice and pulling together lots of different um, seroprevalence studies and getting pinpointing these infection fatality rates. And so the answer is it is definitely uh, more lethal than the flu, um, but it's going to vary a lot depending on the age structure of the population and importantly, the age structure of, of who's out there getting infected. Um, so, so this was... Um, kind of a really important turning point to understand um, how dangerous this infection was. And the next kind of demographic um, concept that I think was really helpful, especially in communicating to the public, was the idea of excess mortality. Um, and, and you guys probably know very well what that is, but it's the idea that we can count the deaths above and beyond what would normally be expected to get a sense of the burden of COVID mortality. And this was actually really important. So, um, you know, at the time, if you remember, a lot of people um, actually, I'll go to that slide, because even today, there is um, quite a bit of belief in the general public. I think this survey from the Kaiser Family Foundation is from, still from 2021, so not even 2020, but the belief that the government is exaggerating. COVID mortality, um, you know, has been a very prevalent kind of piece of uh, misinformation, I guess I would call it. And some of it went back to Trump. I don't know if you remember, and, and still the idea that people are dying with, not of COVID, or that doctors in the U.S. had incentives to code people as dying of COVID to get paid more money. Um, so there was all sorts of um, kind of misinformation about this. And um, so as, as was mentioned a little bit in the intro, I've been part of a science communication platform during the pandemic that started on Facebook just to answer questions for family and friends, um, but kind of grew um, much bigger than we expected. And so back in, I guess this was July of 2020, um, I, I wrote a piece about explaining excess mortality that, you know, no, we actually have some tools. We don't have to um, rely on confirmed COVID deaths to get a sense of the burden of, of COVID, we can count, you know, kind of deaths due to all causes um, and compare that to a counterfactual 2020 without COVID. Um, and this actually was a very intuitive idea then, it turned out when we, um, you know, explained it to a, a more general audience. And this 
this um, post actually was one of our most successful with kind of, you know, a quarter of a million reach on Facebook. And I think, you know, what it was is really giving people a tool to help explain things to their, you know, um, family members who were um, kind of quoting this dying with not of COVID um, and giving these anecdotes that, that we actually have a way to capture this. Um, and so I kind of found it amazing that, you know, a concept like excess mortality, which is kind of a geeky demographic concept that we use for natural disasters and other things, um, became a really important tool, especially when we didn't have, you know, we didn't have life expectancy measures yet because everything was happening just in a matter of months. Um, and I think it was um, just really surprising to see excess mortality plots showing up in the popular press, the New York Times kept um, updating theirs. This is from the Financial Times um, and The Economist had had a running tally of excess mortality. Um, and I think you could also, in this case, really see that the, the patterns of excess mortality also tracked um, you know, the infection itself quite well. Um, and so it doesn't completely answer the question of whether all of these deaths were due to lockdowns, but um, it helps kind of deflect um, that a little bit. And especially this, I kind of um, like this first plot, which was just from the, the very beginning of the first half of 2020 in the U.S., because you can really see how the excess mortality moved across the U.S. in conjunction with the actual infections, not really the restrictions, that it was really concentrated in the Northeast and then moved to the West um, and the South. Um, so excess mortality has been an especially useful way to um, quantify this, the, the burden of mortality at the population level for COVID. Um, and, and so moving on um, to more of what I want to focus on today, um, I wanted to, to kind of highlight the experiences of both the UK and the US and, and kind of try to understand what's going on more recently and, and where we might be going in the future as well. Um, with COVID. So this is a, a snapshot of excess mortality in England um, for the course of the whole pandemic. Um, and you can kind of focus on the top panel where the, the light blue is showing um, excess deaths. Um, but interestingly, you'll see this kind of differs from the US. Um, England had periods of um, negative excess mortality or fewer deaths than expected. Um, kind of during and after some of the lockdowns that were prolonged. And, you know, the, a lot of it was just lack of um, any exposure to other infections. So other respiratory and flu illnesses went way down, but also things like accidents, suicide, and um, substance abuse also went down in the UK. So there were there was some compensation, which is why the total excess deaths in England is actually lower than um, confirmed COVID deaths um, because of some of this capturing of, of negative excess. Um, but I guess one thing to point out, and then the bottom panel just shows in yellow the confirmed COVID deaths, which um, you know, mostly explain all of these excesses until more recently, which we'll, I'll come back to um, later in the talk. But I guess um, one thing to pay attention to that will be different from what happened in the U.S. is, you know, the UK was hit extremely hard in the in the first wave, and also, you know, it was more diffuse across the whole country. So in the US, it was very concentrated in the Northeast, but um, the actual mortality per capita in the US was less than the UK because it wasn't across the entire country. Um, but since vaccines, um, you know, rolled out, if you if you look at um, from kind of July of, of 2021, you can see there have been waves of excess mortality, but they're much, uh, much more muted than they were prior to the vaccine rollout. So that's been the experience um, of the UK so far. Uh, this is the US excess mortality, which actually starts back in 2018. Um, and the little red dashes there show you where um, the estimated excess mortality is is outside of the expected confidence intervals. Um, and so in contrast to England, you can really, you can see that, you know, the worst wave was sort of that winter 2021 wave when vaccines just started rolling out, but that there's been substantial um, mortality even post um, vaccine rollout. 
um, and especially this Omicron wave that led to just um, a huge, you know, big increase in the total number of infections and thus the total number of deaths. And that, you know, we have come down from those peaks, but still seeing some continuous excess um, actually in both countries. So we'll talk a little bit about that. I think, you know, vaccine take up differences across the two countries do um, explain a lot of the difference in that, that huge excess that the U.S. has seen since the summer of 2021. Um, and you can really see this um, kind of where, where the experiences diverged um, in this cumulative um, deaths per capita, or actually this is a relative um, <coughs> excess deaths from a percentage basis that you know, the UK started out much worse because of the widespread um, nature of the, their first wave. Um, but after um, you know, we might have expected vaccines to kind of kick in um, later in 2021, um, the US has really seen sustained excess mortality um, compared, to, um, compared to the UK. Um, so excess mortality has been a was a really good way, especially in the early months, to try to capture that burden of COVID mortality. Um, but it does have some drawbacks um, for comparing across countries and across time. Um, you know, it's it's best captured as an absolute number excess mortality, but it doesn't really account for differences um, in age structure or you know size of the countries. So as as the pandemic wore on, and we actually had a whole year's worth of data. Um, it kind of became time to use this other demographic tool of life expectancy um, that, of course, you know, overcomes these challenges and makes it comparable with different population sizes and age structures um, and, you know, decomposable with our, our standard demographic methods. Um, so our group first wrote this paper that's published in IJE um, looking at 2020 life expectancy changes. Um, and we use data from the human mortality database for all countries that, that had complete data disaggregated by age and sex, um, which was only 29 or 30 countries. So this is by no means um, a good picture of what's truly happening globally. This is really in higher income countries with, with good data. Um, but, you know, it's it was quite sobering, not surprising. We, we knew that 2020 was a bad year. Um, but what we found was that life expectancy declined in 27 out of these 29 countries. Denmark and Norway were the exceptions. Um, and in most countries, males experienced greater losses. Um, so, you know, that was kind of not surprising. But, you know, what, what's disconcerting, I guess, for us is that the biggest losses of 1.5 years or more were um, among males in the U.S., Bulgaria, uh, Poland, and also Sweden. Um, and I think one thing that really always strikes me looking at this figure like this is that, you know, pre-pandemic U.S. life expectancy is actually worse, um, you know, than <laughs> pandemic life expectancy in most um, of these European countries. So we all kind of know this, that the U.S. has been lagging behind in life expectancy for quite some time, but it's kind of sobering to see that even facing a huge pandemic, um, you know, the European countries are doing better than the U.S. was uh, prior to COVID-19. Um, and we also looked at the age, um, what ages contributed to these losses, um, decomposing the losses in life expectancy by age. And, you know, not surprisingly, increases in death rates above age 60 contributed the most to life expectancy declines. But the U.S. was actually you know, an exception to this, where the age distribution of COVID mortality was shifted a lot younger, and in fact, under age 60 contributed the most to life expectancy declines. Um, so you can just see, you know, compared to Italy down there that saw, you know, virtually no contribution of deaths below age 60, um, and that is true for Spain and most, um, you know, European countries. So it was you know, again, the U.S. really standing out in the, the different mortality experience in a way that kind of mirrors the, the longer standing um, problems that we've seen with, with midlife mortality. So, you know, 2021, I think we started that year with a lot of hope that the vaccine rollout would, would bring the pandemic to an end. 
Um, you know, we've since learned that it wasn't going to be that easy, but I think there was a lot of hope at the beginning of 2021. Um, the vaccine rollouts were happening, but we also had this countervailing um, force by the you know second half of the year of new variants that um, were evading this immunity and more transmissible. And so the total number of infections we saw in 2021 worldwide was you know way more than we saw in 2020. So. Um, it was a little unclear how this would affect life expectancy in 2021. Um, and so our group um, also, this is coming, um, is a preprint that you can, can read, but also coming out, um, published soon. And I'm gonna zoom in on some of this because I know um, it's hard to see, but just to orient you. so. This is trying to capture kind of the changes that happened between um, 2019 and 2020, as well as um, 2021. So the top lines represent what happened between 19, um, 2019 and 2020. So that first year of the pandemic, and then the bottom squiggle is what happened in 2021. So, um, and then you can see the, the actual numbers of those changes um, in the right. And you know, it was really compared to twenty um, compared to twenty twenty. There was a lot more heterogeneity in the mortality experiences in across these countries. So fourteen of twenty nine countries um, saw life expectancy losses in both twenty one and twenty compared to twenty nineteen. Um, but some countries did improve from twenty twenty, um, although usually not back to their pre pandemic life expectancy levels. Um, and so if we focus on kind of the bad performers first, Bulgaria fared especially poorly with these, what we call compound losses across 2020 and 2021. So losing, um, you know, over 43 months of life expectancy since 2019. Um, and you can see the Eastern Bloc, um, you know, countries were hit quite hard. Um, but Estonia is kind of an example of also this variability of timing. You know, some countries just happened to get lucky and were not hit particularly hard in 2020. Um, so there's a lot of randomness that that contributes to um, you know how the country's mortality experiences that we have to take into account when we're trying to explain them as well. Um, but I think again, the the disturbing thing here is, is how the U.S. did, and you can see here that the losses in 2021 uh, compared to 2019 were actually worse than they were in 2020. So for a total loss of over 28 months, over two years of life expectancy. Um, and, you know, since these are ordered by kind of the total losses, you can see um, the company, I guess, that, that the countries that are having similar mortality experiences are not those that we typically consider to be our, our peer countries, at least economically, but for mortality, that's starting to be more of our peer group. Um, and moving on to the better, the better news, um, England and Wales did show this small bounce back reflected by kind of that blue part of the arrow um, with they gained two months of life expectancy in 2021 after losing 11.5 months in 2020. Um, and there were two countries, Norway and Switzerland, that actually beat their pre-pandemic life expectancy. Um, but one country, actually Denmark, saw losses in 2021, but not in 2020. So again, there's a bit of um, you know, randomness to the course of the pandemic itself and um, you know, the tr transmission dynamics that are a bit unpredictable across countries. Um, so looking at the ages that contribute to these losses in 2021, again, this is kind of the same type of design, but with the age um, of the visualization, but with age decomposition. So I'll try to zero in here. Um, in all countries, the, the burden of mortality kind of shifted younger in 2021, which makes sense since the rollout in a lot of places was super um, you know, prioritized by age. And also I think you know, by this stage, a lot of a lot of older people had died, um, and then a lot of older people were especially taking, you know, precautions, um, a lot more precautions. In the first waves, you know, there were huge losses in um, nursing homes in, in many countries, and, and that probably, um, they were protected a bit more against that in 2021. Um, so it shifted everywhere a bit younger 
But you can see in the U.S. again, it's really a distinct experience where actually life expectancy losses from the 80 plus were completely reversed in the U.S., but the losses um, at younger ages, including 40 to 59 and even younger, um, got worse than they were in 2020, despite the vaccine rollout. Um, and again, the U.S. is really, you know, unusual in this pattern compared to uh, other European countries. If we look at England, for example, you do see this rebound at the very old ages and some, you know, losses at younger ages, but nothing near the magnitude that we're seeing at younger ages in the U.S. Um, so, you know, it's very, um, it's just very noticeable how different the U.S. experience has been from, from peer countries um, at many different levels. And we'll talk about why that might be the case. Um, we also looked at, um, you know, how this mortality shock compared to historical, um, historical life expectancy shocks. And um, so we have World War II and some influenza pandemics and the darker colors represent bigger losses of life expectancy year on year. Um, and basically what we found was, you know, declines of this magnitude hadn't been seen since um, World War II or the post-Soviet mortality crisis in the Eastern Bloc. And, you know, often even with these bad flu seasons, you know, mortality bounces back within one or two years historically to pre-crisis levels. So, so that's the part that it's very unclear, you know, whether that's going to be the case, um, you know, with COVID, you know, how long will this elevated mortality persist is something that um, concerns me a lot at night. And we also, you know, took a one little pass at looking at the different vaccination rates across countries and how that explained life expectancy deficits. Um, so um, on the right, it's the percentage of the population age 60 plus that was fully vaccinated by October 1st of 2021. And then you know, just looking at mortality in that last quarter because the rollouts you know, were very different in different countries. So it's a little hard to look at earlier in the year. Um, and so again, there's a lot of different things that are correlated with vaccine uptake and rollout in these different countries but there did seem to be an association between life expectancy deficits and uh, the percent of the 16 overs who were fully vaccinated by, by that date. Um, and we also did some Lee Carter forecasts to see what life expectancy um, was projected to be um, in a world without COVID. Um, and you can see, so even for countries that fared well, um, like Norway and Denmark, um, COVID-19 still derailed the trajectory of mortality improvement. So there was no country that actually achieved their projected life expectancy um, in the absence of COVID, um, which is, is definitely sobering. Um, so the, the bottom line from the 2021 life expectancy data was that there was this divergence of experiences. Um, some countries saw bounce backs from their big 2020 losses, um, but others, including the U.S., are seeing real sustained and substantial life expectancy deficits. Um, and I think this will probably be the story going forward. There's, you know, so many different experiences now of um, combinations of vaccines and population immunity um, and different levels of precautions um, that I think the experiences are going to continue to diverge. So... You know, thinking about how is COVID going to continue to affect population mortality is something that I think about a lot and people, lots of people ask for predictions, um, which, you know, epidemiologists have been terrible at making predictions during this pandemic, so don't even try. Um, but it does concern me because I think like everyone, there was this hope that vaccines would kind of bring us back to some kind of new normal um, but we are seeing these new variants that you know, have gotten quite good at evading our existing immunity, at least for infection. Um, you know, they still seem to be providing good protection against severe disease. But I think it's clear that you know, the, the virus itself is going to be with us um, for quite some time. 
and you know what the effect of that is on overall population health and mortality is still you know to be determined but the experiences of the US for example since you know the first vaccine rollout have diverged as i was saying from other european <laughs> countries and part of that again this is kind of very basic counterfactual um, analysis but part of that um, I think is attributed to the lower vaccine uptake in the U.S. So these were some counterfactuals that John Byrne Murdoch of the Financial Times did, just noticing that the U.S. was suffering a lot higher Delta and Omicron mortality and hospitalizations than other European countries. And so this red, um, the red part is the percent of the population over age 60 who are unvaccinated. Um, and it's still, I guess, I'm not sure what it is still in the U.S., but you can see that, that that group was still left a bit vulnerable. And booster take-up, which is these dark blue um, colors, has been much, much lower in, in the U.S. than in European countries. And that seems to really show up um, in the hospitalizations and deaths. So... This um, was a counterfactual taking some assumptions about the risk of hospitalization um, based on vaccination and um, just showing that the U.S. could have had a much more muted um, Omicron wave um, for hospitalizations if they had had the vaccination and booster levels of some European countries. And I was noticing this and just looking at um, data from England that Omicron really hardly raised mortality in England, and they did a huge, not only was the take up um, of vaccines originally much higher at older ages in the US, but the booster campaign reached almost everyone within a matter of weeks in December. So there was um, a really big difference in take up and especially by age compared to the US. Um, and this in fact is what that difference in deaths looked like between July and December um, of last year between England um, in the US. So there were really big differences. You know, at an absolute level, it's not surprising that it was the older groups um, with the higher mortality, but just looking at the relative mortality, again, the US um, kind of showed a much bigger shift in mortality to these younger middle ages. Um, and so this, you know, was gets to be especially heartbreaking when if this is, you know, past the era when um, vaccines were available to everyone. Uh, just to see these huge differences. And this really was the moment that the mortality experiences between the US and the UK diverged um, considerably in um, the number of confirmed COVID deaths. Um, so you know, the vaccine uptake is, is a strong, strong culprit here, I would argue. Um, but I think you know, many of us who've studied kind of the US disadvantage in health for some time are wondering. You know, what else is going on with the U.S. that's making this mortality experience so much worse from COVID? Um, and, you know, I think it's a very complex, um, a complex question that definitely includes vaccine take up, but the politicalization of the pandemic and all of the non-pharmaceutical interventions becoming, you know, kind of political identity statements, um, I think, you know, had big repercussions in the U.S. Um, but then there's also underlying social and biological vulnerabilities um, that presumably have been reflected for years in our life expectancy data. And this is a paper comparing um, you know, various uh, chronic conditions and bi biomarkers in the HRS compared to the ELSA study for 55 to 64 year olds. Um, and it just shows that for all sorts of chronic conditions, especially diabetes, inflammation, high blood pressure, um, you know, U.S. Um, adults of that age are, are doing a lot worse. And those were all kind of risk factors for, for more severe COVID. So that's definitely one um, explanation. This is also just comparing the distribution of BMI for that same group, 55 to 60, or for everyone ages 50 and plus. And you can see that the distribution of BMI is shifted to the right for the US. And you know, it ends up meaning there's a lot more people in that kind of extreme obesity categories from 35 and above, which again was, um, was a significant risk factor for severe COVID. 
Um, but as I mentioned, we know that the U.S. has been lagging behind its peers um, for many, many years in life expectancy. I just always find this, yeah, kind of stunning, although you see England and Wales are kind of falling to the bottom of, of that as well, which is, yeah, the topic of, of the grant that I just got to try to understand. Um, but obviously, the COVID pandemic was accentuating a lot of existing vulnerabilities um, in U.S. population health. And um, I think a lot of people here are doing really good work on that. I know Noreen um, and other people at OPR worked, um, you know, put out some of the early estimates of race, ethnic uh, differences in COVID mortality and have been doing a lot of, of good work on that. Um, we just published one again, looking, comparing the losses across race, ethnicity in the U.S. and decomposing by cause of death and by age. So yeah, this is a little, um, a lot to take in, but the um, these are losses in life expectancy um, in red from 2019 to 2020, um, but the blue lines show kind of what happened between 2010 and 2019 um, by age group. And these are all males, um, causes of death, cancer, CBD, um, despair, which includes drugs, alcohol, and suicide. Um, and COVID-19, and then we have white, black, and Hispanic American categories. Um, and so there's a lot of detail in the paper just about how causes of death um, have contributed to these Hi, yeah. um, differences across time. But a lot of the story was, you know, how um, devastating that it was to Hispanic Americans. So the life expectancy drop for white males in the U.S. was 1.6 years in 2020, but 3.6 years for Black Americans and 4.5 years for Hispanic males. So it was just a huge difference. And a lot of this was due to, uh, again, a younger um, age profile of COVID deaths among Hispanics, more at working ages, um, which again, there's, I think, really important work going on to try to unpack if that was increased exposure. Um, you know, through service jobs, um, living arrangements, all sorts of social determinants. But um, I guess the other thing is despair deaths have actually contributed considerably, and these are primarily drug overdose deaths, um, even, um, you know, in 2020. And this has been quite unique to the U.S. as well. So in many other countries, um, substance abuse deaths actually declined, but the opioid um, overdose or fentanyl, I guess, related deaths continued to increase um, in the U.S. Uh, during the COVID pandemic. So um, this is just to highlight that, yeah, the U.S. story also includes um, a lot of, of social determinants of COVID mortality that have played out in somewhat expected but um, really unfortunate ways. Um, which brings us to what's you know, kind of going on today, and what I think is really striking is mortality is kind of trucking along. It looks, you know, way better this, than it than it used to be in the U.S., but we're still for the last um, for the whole summer really facing four to four to five hundred deaths per day um, in the U.S. Still as a steady state of COVID deaths, and I I don't know how many people are kind of aware it's of this. It's really dropped out of the news, but this was over 15,000 Americans dying of COVID in August of, of 2022, for example. Um, so it means it's still the third leading cause of, of death. Um, and excess deaths then are still really at least 10% kind of above their expected level. Um, and so this is kind of what, what does continue to keep me up at night is, you know, what is this new normal going to be? Are we going to ever see a return to kind of the baseline mortality um, that we saw pre-pandemic, you know, much less having improvements that we would have hoped for? Um, or are we going to see a, per, you know, consistently elevated risk of death um, is one of my concerns. And again, the U.S., um, part of the story is lack of vaccine coverage. There's still a lot of room for improvement. Um, and we know that, again, this has become very politicized and socially patterned. So um, let's see, the, the green bars there are completely unvaccinated and the dark blue is, is vaccinated and boosted. Um, but just some of the, the things, important elements you can see are 
Um, yeah, Republicans compared to Democrats are way at the top as far as coverage, uh, household income, adults without a college degree. So the vaccine um, and booster coverage. So even 60% of the older population in the U.S. has still not even received their first booster. Um, so there's a lot of room for improvement, but we're we're facing kind of the common um, the common challenges of social determinants, but this extra layer of politicalization on top of that. Um, and as I said, the U.S. has also been unique in that overdose deaths have actually increased during the pandemic. Uh, compared, even though they were trending up prior to the pandemic, they've been um, exceeding what was expected. And that has also contributed then some to these life expectancy losses and, and excess mortality from non-COVID causes. Um, so this is you know, where we are in 2020 for cumulative excess deaths in the US compared to 2021. And you know, I certainly hope that that, that line is, is flattening out and we're not gonna see the huge winter surge of deaths that we saw. Um, but I think it's, it's concerning that so far 2022 is actually not better than 2021, um, even though we're kind of politically moving on from the pandemic and Biden just said the pandemic is over, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so yeah, I, I think it's still worth us paying attention and thinking about ways we can mitigate at the population level. Um, but just to jump back to the UK for, for a minute, as a comparison, um, as I said, the more recent post-vaccination waves were very muted, um, but there's been growing concern that we're seeing excess deaths this past summer that are, again, about 15% um, above what would be expected. And this has caused a lot of head scratching about what could be going on, because it's also um, you know, not completely accounted for by COVID deaths. Um, which are usually attributed pretty well in the UK. So, you know, this has led to, to some exploration of different hypotheses, but you can see here the increase in non-COVID excess deaths um, this past summer. And, you know, there are a few hypotheses, um, you know, for what's going on in the, in, the US, in the UK. We have not seen increase in deaths of despair in England. So that one has actually gone down. Um, but the NHS has been under tremendous pressure um, you know, throughout the whole pandemic and even prior to the pandemic. But this has led to extreme backlogs in care and also ambulance wait times and emergency room wait times have become, you know, kind of astronomical. Um, and this does seem to kind of correlate with um, these excess deaths. At least this is all sort of very descriptive. Um, but these excess wait times, you know, we know lead to higher mortality the longer you have to wait for an ambulance or in the emergency room. Um, and that seems to be um, one of the potential explanations for what's going on this past summer. Um, causes of death, it does seem to be a lot of heart and circulatory diseases. Um, we still see decreases in other respiratory illnesses. I think it's really interesting that cancer has gone down in most um, cases over the course of the pandemic, because it was a big worry that lack of, of cancer screening and delayed treatment would increase mortality. So, but that has, has not yet um, happened, which I think is really interesting. And so I think the fact that it's heart and circulatory diseases, you know, could mean that these are emergency things that are not getting treated in a timely fashion. Um, but there's also a lot of new research um, showing that there are longer term cardiovascular effects of acute COVID illness. And you know, so one hypothesis is that we're starting to see um, that finally show up in the mortality data. Um, and again, these are observational studies, but that have been done pretty carefully um, to try to estimate the elevated risk of all sorts of cardiovascular um, diseases. Um, but I think there is a lot of evidence that even though we, we thought of it as a respiratory illness, that, that SARS-CoV-2 is really also a vascular disease and elevates the risk of, of clotting and all sorts of things acutely and for a period of time after. Um, and so we're seeing a lot of strokes and heart failure and things even um, you know, months later, 
And so that's you know, one of the more troubling interpretations of why excess mortality is now elevated in England and Wales. And even when the queen died, Twitter is kind of a nightmare for putting out um, quick takes. But so some people said she died because she got the COVID vaccines. But so this is, I'm not saying this is true at all, but you know, I was not surprised that people were speculating. She had COVID in February, reported some long COVID symptoms in the spring. Um, and so given that her mom lived to 103, there's, you know, this counterfactual of, you know, did COVID contribute um, to the premature death at, at age 96 of the queen? But uh, it's possible that the queen's, yeah, was contributing to excess mortality that was above and beyond what we would have expected. So looking forward, um, I really hope that overall, this is um, a topic that a lot of great tomographers and population health researchers will take on. But I think there's a lot of uncertainty, as I said, about you know, we really don't know the course of the pandemic. Will we get better vaccines or will the variants kind of keep up in that arms race of evading our immunity, um, you know, better treatments? Um, or are we really facing a higher baseline level of risk and mortality for, for the near future? Um, and then we still have a lot to worry about the delayed impact of those indirect shocks, um, delayed healthcare screenings and treatments, um, kind of the byproducts of the overwhelmed health services. I think we're, we're just going to start seeing the impact of that. Um, of course, there's mortality displacement that can work in the opposite direction that a lot of vulnerable people have died in the last couple of years, and thus overall mortality could be lower. But I think that's my opinion is I would be overwhelmed by kind of the scarring effects of those who have been seriously ill, hospitalization, um, you know, being on a ventilator is not, not very good for your uh, long-term um, prognosis. And then on top of that, these long-term long COVID effects that we're only really starting to quantify. Um, and then finally, the, the aspect that a lot of us studied before COVID, you know, what are the long-term impacts on health of all of this social and economic disruption associated with the pandemic? Um, and so I think there's lots of challenges for us as population health researchers. You know, what is the new baseline? Excess mortality starts to get hard when you don't have a baseline of expected mortality to compare it to. Um, how do we really disentangle all of these different impacts, um, the direct effects of, of COVID on, on heart disease versus indirect effects? Um, and I think long COVID is going to be um, a really prickly area of research because a lot of it is observational and self-reported and it has a lot of challenges associated with um, understanding if that's really the cause of, of poor health. So I think that's going to be a methodological challenge for us, but also something we need to um, you know, try to be sympathetic. There's been a lot of diseases where that are self-reported um, and people are not getting believed that they have these real symptoms and long COVID seems to mirror some of those um, previous experiences. And then um, one thing also that I, I guess really hope for is that our community can think about how to, how to explain the various mortality experiences across and even within countries, there's huge variation within the US. Um, because I feel like if we don't learn you know, from what happened in the last two and a half years, it would be just an incredible shame to not um, have some things that we can take forward and hopefully prepare for in the future. Um, but at the same time, the, the challenges methodologically to understanding these cross-country differences and attributing them to specific um, you know, differences in vaccination or interventions is, is going to be really hard. So um, it's not something I take lightly, but something I charge everyone um, with. And I will try to wrap up. So yeah, this I just kind of want to encourage everyone um, to keep in mind that a pandemic is a population, not an individual problem. And I think it's really important for us to keep emphasizing um, that zooming out and, and thinking about um, the population perspective. So even if the risk of death has gone down a lot due to prior infection and vaccination, for example, at the individual level, when you have um, hugely frequent and highly prevalent infection, 
you know, a small percent of a very large number at the population level is going to add up to a very big burden of um, morbidity and mortality. So I think that's something we need to keep keep reminding people as the U.S. is tempted to get into the you do you, I guess, version of, of public health. So I'll stop there. Thank you.